Batman fans have clocked in their second and third views of The Batman by now. Wondering what details they're spotting that you didn't? Keep watching to find out. Robert Pattinson's bat suit is one of the most functional looking to date, but it's partially inspired by a much older design. Modern filmmakers know that Batman needs to be decked out in armor to deflect bullets. He isn't Superman, after all. But he still needs to look like Batman. Perhaps the most recognizable aspect of Batman's attire is his cowl. Unlike the ones worn by Christian Bale and Ben Affleck, Robert Pattinson's cowl isn't one seamless mold. Instead, it's multiple pieces stitched together. This reflects the homemade nature of his outfit. This is an early years Batman, let's not forget. But there's more to it than that. When you take a closer look at the cowl seen in the Batman, you'll notice that the nose piece is flat and stitched onto the headwear. If it looks oddly familiar, that's because Adam West's caped crusader wore a similar cowl. Matt Reeves confirmed in a Q&A via Insider that the new cowl was inspired by the one worn by West in the classic 60s TV show. Every Batman story needs a solid villain, and the Batman has exactly that. The Riddler bludgeons his way through Gotham's corrupt leadership, leaving a trail of clues for Batman to decipher. On the surface, the Riddler is a madman exacting brutal revenge upon those sucking the life out of Gotham. In reality, however, he's simply emulating the Dark Knight. The Riddler even states that Batman inspired him. A closer inspection of the Riddler's crusade reveals just how similar he and Batman are. For starters, they both hide behind masks, which, according to the Riddler, allows them to be their true selves. Both are orphans, with personas born from tragedy, a major plot point in the film. They both hold a deep hatred of the corrupt. Batman brutalizes his enemies while the Riddler violently murders them. Whether Bruce Wayne likes it or not, he and the Riddler are similar. Both men are on a quest for vengeance, a word that holds significant meaning for the Dark Knight. I'm vengeance. It's only when one of the Riddler's followers also claims to be vengeance that Batman realizes he must elevate his mission to one of hope. Batman always has a few allies around, despite his lone wolf act. One of the most important among them is Alfred, who has always been by the caped crusader's side. The version of the loyal butler seen in The Batman, played by Andy Serkis, appears to be more of a family bodyguard. At one point, Alfred tells Bruce that it was his duty to protect Thomas and Martha and states at another point that he taught Bruce how to fight. Batman's combat prowess is there for all to see, so it's likely that Alfred is a skilled fighter himself. It's not an idea without precedent. The Batman Earth-1 comic features a version of Alfred that trained Bruce in all that he knows, as he was a former operative in the SAS. You needed a father. And all you had was me. At the beginning of the film, a minor detail concerning Alfred's face may go unnoticed initially. Viewers who examine his left eyebrow will see that he has a scar or abrasion of some sort long before he takes the brunt of the Riddler's bomb in Wayne Tower. The scar could be from his past, or perhaps Alfred has assisted Batman in the field, just as he did in Batman Earth-1. It's a mystery for now, but it's definitely a visual clue that indicates a violent history. The Batman establishes that Carmine Falcone had a history with Thomas Wayne. In the film, Falcone recalls Bruce's physician father operating on him in the Wayne household, saying that he saw a young Bruce looking down on the scene from the staircase. The mobster indicates that he and Thomas were close, but Bruce isn't having any of it. The younger Wayne says that all it means is that his dad took the Hippocratic Oath. Later, Batman apprehends Falcone and brings him out into the open where he gets shot by the Riddler. The Dark Knight is looking down at the gangster as he draws his final breath, and Falcone appears to realize something just before he dies. One could argue that he's simply in shock having been shot, but Falcone has a distinct look of surprise on his face as he gazes up at the Dark Knight. Could it be that he just realized that Bruce Wayne is the Batman? It would seem to bring the story that Falcone told Bruce earlier in the film full circle. If true, it's a subtle but poetic detail that gives some extra weight to the villain's death. Jim Carrey portrayed a far more eccentric version of the Riddler in Joel Schumacher's Batman Forever, a film that couldn't be more different from the Batman in terms of approach. While Batman Forever is generally considered one of the less memorable Batman movies, many critics praised Carrey's performance with his over-the-top antics suiting the style of the movie. It appears as though Matt Reeves and the costume designers for The Batman decided to honor Carrie's take on the Riddler by giving Paul Dano's version of the character the same glasses. The clear-framed spectacles he's seen in look almost identical to those briefly worn by Carrie's Edward Nigma before he switches to his villainous contact lenses. 
It's a subtle but clear nod to the character's history, and you may not be able to look at Paul Dano's version of the Riddler the same way again as a result. Oh, this is not how this was supposed to go! Batman has undergone a transformation by the time the film comes to a close. In the beginning, Bruce's mission is in desperate need of some better PR, when the innocent people of Gotham are afraid of the Caped Crusader. That's a bit of a red flag. At first, citizens loved Batman's brutal quest for vengeance, but much like the vigilante himself, they soon realized that a hero needs more than just anger to do good in the world. The early moments of the Batman show a soul who is just as crushed and defeated as those attempting to survive in the worst parts of the city. Bruce is angry. His hatred of the criminal element is on full bone-crunching display as he viciously pummels bad guys into the ground. He's a creature of the night who only feels comfortable in the shadows. After all, Bruce is seen walking around indoors during daylight hours with sunglasses on. He's either sensitive to the light from long nights in the dark, or he and the light just don't mix. In the third act, however, Bruce begins to embrace a new purpose, providing hope to the people of Gotham. He leads the humanitarian efforts as the city reacts to the flooding caused by the Riddler. Gone are the rage-filled days of vengeance. This is a new Batman who isn't afraid to be out during the day, a symbolic echo of the character's growth. The Riddler goes after the Wayne family hard when he's airing Gotham's dirty laundry. He alleges that Thomas Wayne had a journalist murdered in cold blood. The reason? The journalist had information about Martha Wayne's psychiatric struggles and he threatened to go public with it during Thomas Wayne's mayoral campaign. Alfred clears up the messy story for Bruce, explaining that Thomas didn't care about the campaign, only about the harm the information would do to his wife. He did ask Falcone for help dissuading the reporter from publishing, but only as a last resort. Thomas went through the proper channels at first, even sending a cease and desist letter. A portion of that letter is shown up close in one scene, where it's revealed that it was sent from the Miller & Moore law firm. Comic book fans will immediately recognize those names as references to Frank Miller and Alan Moore who wrote The Dark Knight Returns and The Killing Joke, respectively. Both are prolific comic book writers who have made significant contributions to the world of Batman over the years, and the letter serves as a nice nod to their legacies. The Riddler's plot to destroy Gotham's seawall and flood the city was in the works for quite some time, it would seem. Late in the film, we learn that he's been planning a series of devastating explosions with other radicals online. However, one long-since-past event set the stage for the seawall being an exploitable tool for the Riddler. It turns out that the funding provided by the Renewal Project was supposed to go towards the upkeep of the seawall, confirmed in a blink-and-you'll-miss-it moment. In an image of newspaper clippings that flashes up on the screen, one headline is noteworthy. Seawall construction stalled. This headline indicates that seawall safety was put on the back burner when the funding mysteriously vanished. It left the wall vulnerable, and the Riddler knew it. The greed of those in power left the city in a dangerous position, which the villain was able to exploit. The Batman might paint a bleak portrait of a city drowning in its own filth, but there are still a few moments of levity in there. The Riddler cracks a rather morbid joke near the start of the film, attaching the mayor's actual thumb to a thumb drive. Jim Gordon is also quick to hit those sarcastic notes, offering viewers the odd chuckle. Oh, this guy's hilarious. After Batman uses the Batmobile to flip Penguin's car, he and Gordon begin to interrogate the crooked club owner. They believe that he's the one who ratted on the Moroni crime family, longtime rivals of the Falcone family. Of course, the Penguin insists that he isn't the rat, and is even disgusted by the suggestion. He also unintentionally gives Batman a new lead. When Batman and Gordon exit the scene, they leave Penguin standing there with his hands and legs tied. It's one of the funniest moments in the movie. The Penguin waddles like an actual penguin as he yells at the departing good guys, a choice that must have been made with the animal in mind. Early in The Batman, Bruce Wayne discusses his bleak outlook for Gotham amongst a montage of thugs committing crimes all over the city. One of these crooks is robbing a convenience store while wearing a green mask that looks like a misshapen jack-o'-lantern. This mask comes across as inconsequential the first time you watch the movie. It's Halloween night, after all, and the robber wants to hide his face for obvious reasons. We come to realize that this is no store-bought Halloween mask, however. The mask actually resembles a drop, the fictional drug that is plaguing Gotham. They are administered through the eyes, and they are apparently highly addictive. The mask resembles an image of a drop seen on an anti-drug billboard, but the PSA doesn't appear to be helping very much. The Riddler is an enigmatic killer shrouded in mystery. Once Batman begins following the trail of clues and carnage, he learns more about the villain and what he's really after. 
While the Riddler clearly has a motive in mind, his style bears a resemblance to the fictional serial killer that made a big splash in 1978's Halloween. The opening moments of the Batman were given a voyeuristic view through the Riddler's eyes. We hear steady breathing from behind his mask, much like the young Michael Myers. The Riddler then stalks the mayor, waiting in the shadows. Once the moment is right, he emerges and brutally murders his victim in true Michael Myers fashion. Later in the film, another famous Halloween scene is replicated when D.A. Gil Coulson becomes the Riddler's next victim. The unsuspecting lawman gets into his car, but he's not alone. The Riddler is waiting in the back seat, and by the time he notices, it's too late. While he doesn't kill Coulson then and there, it's a parallel to Annie Brackett's death in the slasher classic. Matt Reeves has indeed confirmed that he took cues from several 70s films, with The French Connection, Chinatown, and Taxi Driver all providing inspiration in different ways. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.